Oh, okay, I can pass it around. Yeah. Hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, with the rain and the tr penguins traffic, I appreciate you all being here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Stacy Federoff. I'm the president of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh and um, have been for the past uh, three going on four years now. And uh, I'm glad to bring together some uh, different groups here who are interested in Italian culture to hear from Anna and Giuseppina. Uh, I wanted to let, there are a few students here, so I wanted to let, just to mention that we have our scholarship contest coming up Friday, February 23rd, 9 o'clock, uh, 9 a.m. here in the Point Park Center for Media Innovation. And uh, the speaker uh, will give a presentation and an interview, and then students have an hour to write a uh, story, a feature story about her on deadline. So, uh, and you can uh, win s the scholarship prizes and uh, are able to come to our banquet, which is in April, April 14th, at the Rivers Club, Saturday, April 14th. Um, otherwise, I uh, don't have anything else to say other than to introduce Anna, who will be our featured speaker. Thank you, Stacey. Hi, everybody, and thank you for having me here. I am an Italian journalist, as you know. Um, I come from Italy, and I come from Trieste, where I am living now. It's a city port. I show you where is it, Trieste. It's a city port in Northeast uh, Italy, and uh, since uh, 2008, uh, I have worked for RAI. RAI is the National Public Broadcasting Company. I show the logo. And, um, you know, I think it's important to explain to you um, what is RAI and what is public uh, uh, television in Italy, what it means. Uh, and RAI is the biggest TV and the radio uh, broadcaster, and for sure is the most popular. Uh, for the long history of the company, for sure, and you know, figures that our uh, public radio station um, started in 1924, so uh, between uh, two world wars, the, between uh, the world wars, so uh, that's a long history behind. And RAI is owned by Minister of Economy, so when I tell that it's public television, it's really public television because it's owned by Minister of Economy, so by the state. And to support the national public television, we used to pay an annual TV tax, and uh, uh, that's something happened for all public television in Europe. And in our case, it's like in England for BBC, in our case, it's nine 90 euros a year. And uh, that's funny to say that it, we used to say that's the most hated tax in Italy. <laughs> And you know, um, um, the government, so people in the past found a way of evading it. Uh, and uh, in two years ago, in 2016, uh, the government opted to include this uh, annual uh, tax uh, in the people's electricity bill. So everybody pays now, but it's important. I told to the students last week when I see the students at Point Park University, I said it's important because it's a way to save and to, um, to have uh, a democratic information because uh, this annual tax is used to, for support RAI, of course, to support RAI, but not only RAI, all newspapers, all private TV, all private radio stations. So it's a in a small part, of course, but it's a way to help everybody who wants to have uh, a democratic information. That's why I'm very fan of this tax, <laughs> and they pay, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you have to think that 90 euros a year is less than 10 uh, euros a month, and that supports uh, 15 TV public channel from Rai, 15, and all news information system, three radio stations, and uh, local information as well. And I come from local information, so um, I'm proud, and uh, I'm local reporter for uh, um, uh, 
regional branch of RAI and I worked for eight years uh, in my region is Veneto in Venice for eight years and for the last two years in Trieste you now you know where is Trieste and uh, um, I think the local information is one of the main characteristics of RAI. Italy is composed by 20 regions, uh, and RAI has, uh, sorry, I have to do for 20 times. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ah, done. And um, 20 regions, so 20 newsrooms, 20 um, public newsroom, 20 um, newscasters, more than 20 newscasters because there are a lot of uh, edition and uh, to cover the story of all the country there are uh, 650 journalists employed in the territory so um, it's something very important and uh, you know Rai regional news uh, program with 650 journalists uh, is the largest broadcast news organization in Europe so we are like uh, a press agency for the national newscaster because when I write a story an important story if something important happen in my uh, happens in my area uh, I will follow this story for my newscaster but also for the national uh, our national newscasters because the same story will be uh, transmitted also in Rome and in in the the whole country. So that's why I think I'm proud and uh, of course uh, it's interesting you know if you are from an area you can know the background of that area and you are well prepared and you can explain maybe better what is happening in your place you know. And um, thinking about uh, uh, the title Notizia News uh, that Stacy made up uh, in a wonderful way and she said, notizia means news. So what is notizia now in Italy? So I thought it was nice to show you our two most important newspaper in Italy, Corriere della Sera e Repubblica, um, in the last few weeks. Uh, um, what is they are speaking about in this period? Of course, they are speaking about Me Too, the international movement. Uh, um, there is uh, an open letter, Moleste non abbiamo paura, uh, by 124 women of uh, show business to support the movement uh, Me Too. So actresses, writers and movie directors uh, who said uh, the time is over. And then there is uh, this one is uh, L'asilo senza vaccino, so school without vaccination, because uh, uh, that's a reaction after new law about vaccination. The Italian government forced the compulsory vaccination for kids at school. And that's something happened in Italy because we need to do that in this moment, but it's happening all over Europe. I don't know in the uh, United States what's the situation about that, but a lot of parents in Italy are deciding don't vaccinate kids so government uh, decide to do that and uh, I read maybe last week uh, France French government decide to do the same like in Italy so we are um, and then a Repubblica um, Hello, um, American politics and stock exchange news uh, are always in our front page uh, of our newspaper so um, this is about uh, Wall Street what's happened 10 days ago maybe, last week, I don't remember, there was a market drop and our newspaper every day um, speak about uh, um, American politics, Trump, Melania sometimes. And um, another important topic, and I will speak a lot about that, is immigration. So you can read there, Fronte Anti-Migranti. Uh, I will explain you why. And then uh, another uh, republic again, Trump, there is Trump, and that's uh, the news is about the Italian translation of the book uh, Fury and the Fire by Michael Wolff. And uh, again, uh, Repubblica, uh, that's the topic, stop to the new fascism, and I explain now why. As you know, a huge mass of people indeed are in need are coming to Italy and uh, all over Europe. Italy is the first door um, to come in Europe. Uh, and they are refugees from Eritrea, Libya, F Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, they are escaping poverty, hunger, uh, dictator 
dictatorial uh, government and uh, this current immigration process looks unstoppable and the challenge uh, to the European Union is to welcome these people and uh, this topic is the most important topic in Italy in this moment because we have our uh, political campaign there will be the election next month uh, so that's a really important topic uh, and uh, you can see pictures are very strong maybe you know because something is happening in the United States too but uh, uh, since January 2018 so just one month one month and a half uh, 4,000 Six seventy hundred thirty one uh, people have have landed on the Italian coasts. You think that's huge, that's too much, but you have to think that this number is uh, sixty percent less than last year. So even if um, the uh, data of the Minister of the Interior shows that the numbers of uh, immigrants are dropping, people are scared because. I don't know if it's easy to understand, but these people um, come in Italy and all over the Europe and they walk around the city, they are everywhere and uh, um, it's difficult to manage these people in a good way and sometimes new as journalists, we don't do a good job sometimes and sometimes it's hard to do a good job to communicate this situation. It's an emergency and that started uh, women too um, I think um, almost four years ago so it's a long process uh, and um, you can see that's the way how the immigrants come by boat on the south of Italy but also on foot on the Balkanic way so I live in Trieste and that you you saw where is Trieste near Slovenia so near east part of Europe and they come they walk and they arrive walking uh, for months and months uh, uh, with kids and sometimes I uh, cover story about them and I mm, I did I made a story about them uh, they arrive walking in our country uh, with kids uh, with the uh, women uh, that's amazing uh, and this phenomenon started around four years ago a lot and a lot of landings and four years um, exasperated the climate the political climate and uh, Above all now, because uh, next March uh, we have political elections and that's the main topic. And um, um, I said exasperated the climate, the political climate. So uh, what happened, look what happened uh, 10 days ago in Macerata. Macerata is a small country town in uh, central Italy. An Italian man, I show you in the... Uh, New York Times newspaper so you can read and understand more. An Italian man, Luca Traini, 28, anni, uh, 28 <laughs> 28 years old, opened fire on uh, African immigrants on the street. Uh, he injured uh, six black people and he was driving and uh, he shooted. And uh, when he was arrested, uh, uh, he made the fascist salute uh, in front of the police and uh, he uh, was dropping uh, around his shoulders, tricolor flag. Uh, this shooting happened uh, a few days after a, a Nigerian migrant was arrested in connection with um, the murder of uh, a young girl, Pamela. But this trainee, this man, had nothing to do with the story of this girl. Um, what he, uh, he did is a, it was a reaction uh, against immigrants in general. Uh, and after this serious matter, Italian and foreign newspapers started to talk about new fascism in Italy. Um, I showed you before um, uh, in Repubblica, they wrote in the title, uh, New Fascism in Italy. And that's what uh, also, um, you know, English newspaper is writing uh, um, this is uh, the Guardian English uh, newspaper fascism is back in Italy and it's uh, paralyzing, paralyzing the political system and again and again uh, Italy is being uh, driving into the arms of uh, fascists so all the time that because for uh, 
uh, newspaper columnist uh, uh, Macerata Attack is the product of some racist political speech. For them, Italy is experiencing a rebirth of xenophobia and uh, contemporary neo-fascism, new fascism. So immigrant will be the main issue of upcoming election. And uh, the central right party is uh, extremely well placed uh, for the next elections. Um, this is Washington Post, an American journal, and uh, all the time the same title. Speaking of the political uh, election, I must say something about, new, uh, about fake news because um, Facebook uh, has uh, uh, tasked a team of independent fact checkers in Italy to hunt down uh, um, fake news. And that's something new. This is the first experiment. Uh, and uh, anti-ox uh, experiment uh, where uh, professional fact checkers are involved. I mean, Facebook appointed a agency to do that. So that's not something Facebook does, but uh, an agency is involved to do that. Uh, about my uh, Pittsburgh is life, I said, um, maybe you are wondering why I'm here. I'm here because my husband has a, a a wonderful opportunity to come here. He is a researcher, he is a physician, and uh, um, he is working at UPMC Hospital. And we have two daughters, and we said that that's a great opportunity for all of us. Uh, my daughters are very young, uh, mm, so one year and four years. So, um, but I said it's a, a good way to improve my English. That's hard, I know, I know very hard but uh, for my daughters is a way to start to speak English and um, you can't understand how is important that you can't maybe someone can understand <laughs> so uh, we decided to come uh, all together and um, mm, at the same time I thought it was a, a good opportunity for me like journalist uh, visiting local TV station that's my family the first day in Pittsburgh <laughs> <laughs> And that's, you know, the host of uh, WPXI. So uh, during my stay here, I am uh, improving my English and visiting local TV stations. I have visited WQED, so public television, WPXI, uh, private television, so profit and no profit um, company. And that's for me uh, a wonderful experience. At the same time, I had the opportunity to do my job. I mean, I, I'm not working, of course, uh, because I'm uh, in uh, maternity time uh, in Italy, I can't explain that, but we have a lot of time. And uh, <laughs> I didn't take this time when my daughters were young because I didn't need uh, And now I'd said that that's a great opportunity and I take this six months. So I can't work, but I'm working by myself. So I'm doing some story about Pittsburgh, what is interesting for me in Pittsburgh. And I'm doing by myself with my iPhone and my iPad. And then uh, I will, I sharing the story on my Facebook profile and on Rai Facebook profile and they will show my story in the television when I come back in March and this story in particular mm, speaking of uh, welcoming immigrants uh, because when I arrived uh, the first thing I saw and uh, impressed me was the uh, billboard outside of the yards of family of house and on the windows of stores um this sign said this sign that sign <laughs> wonderful that sign uh no matters where you come from you are welcome and they said why they need to do that why they need to show that everywhere on the street in my uh, neighborhood i'm living in squitter hill everywhere beautiful house, rich house, I thought, uh, rich house, need to say that. Uh, I think it's amazing. And you know, I'm so um, impressed uh, about what is happening in Italy about immigration. So I said, uh, I have to understand more about that. And uh, um, I uh, discovered that this story, uh, Mm, this, this, this was an idea of uh, Mennonite Church uh, two years ago during the uh, Donald Trump campaign. And then now uh, these signs are uh, spread all, o all over the United States. And um, that's a way to say uh, in Italy, look how 
Pittsburgh is welcoming people. Um, my stay here is wonderful, I'm happy, and um, I have been welcomed really well I, um, uh, with my family. I had um, Pittsburgh welcomed us uh, very well, and so that's why I said I have to do that. I showed just a little bit because there are a lot of Italian, just for that reason. You can understand a lot of you. Gli alberati, i quartieri puliti, case eleganti e nei giardini di queste case appariscenti cartelli colorati. Passeggiando nell'area residenziale di Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania è impossibile non notare i tanti manifesti di benvenuto all'ingresso delle abitazioni. No matter where you come from, non importa da dove vieni, siamo felici tu sia il nostro vicino di casa. Un messaggio scritto in più lingue, inglese, spagnolo, arabo. A volte i cartelli hanno forme e colori diversi, ma parlano sempre d'accoglienza. Ci chiediamo perché in questa bella la città del Nord America, 2 milioni di abitanti, buon tenore di vita nelle classifiche risulta al primo posto tra le città più vivibili degli Stati Uniti, i cittadini hanno bisogno di esternare questo messaggio. La risposta la troviamo online. L'iniziativa Welcome Your Neighbors è stata lanciata dalla chiesa Menonita a confermarcelo Dale Swazan, pastore della comunità di Pittsburgh. Well, the story around the origination of these signs la storia che sta dietro a questi cartelli riguarda la chiesa di Harrisburg, in West Virginia. Nel loro quartiere c'erano molti arabi e ispanici. Così nell'estate del 2015, quando la campagna di Trump è diventata più aggressiva, quando ha cominciato a dire che i messicani erano diventatori, persone di cui avere paura, bad hombres, uomini cattivi, ecco, in quel momento molte persone hanno capito che quel modo di parlare era creato ad hoc per impaurire farci sentire insicuri. Questa chiesa di Harzenburg ha voluto reagire pensando che il silenzio equivalesse alla complicità. Dalla chiesa di Harrisonburg ci spiegano che quantificare il numero di cartelli esposti è impossibile, solo loro ne hanno venduti oltre 10.000 specie in Virginia, Pennsylvania, Indiana e Ohio, ma in ogni stato molte associazioni si sono impegnate a stampare e vendere i manifesti. Supponiamo oltre 10.000 cartelli siano fuori dalle case degli americani, ci scrivono nella mail di risposta. Solo a Pittsburgh, secondo il pastore Dave, se ne contano oltre 500. Le persone che hanno scelto di acquistare il manifesto non sempre appartengono alla chiesa menonita, come Patricia, che ricorda gli insegnamenti di Mr. Rogers, un personaggio televisivo che in America per 30 anni ha cresciuto milioni di bambini insegnando rispetto. To me this means that we are in neighborhood. We are Mr. Rogers. Per me questo significa che viviamo in un quartiere e siamo vicini di casa di Mr. Rogers. Viviamo a Pittsburgh dove Mr. Rogers stesso viveva e questo è un posto inclusivo che accoglie. Ecco il motivo per cui ho deciso di comprare questo cartello. Così nelle case, così nei caffè, nelle vetrine dei negozi o in libreria dove il proprietario Dan ci dice. We have here in the store. That we want to be open and inclusive to everyone. Noi vogliamo essere aperti, inclusivi con tutti e non vogliamo che nessuno si senta in imbarazzo o non accettato nel nostro negozio. Tutti sono benvenuti. Pittsburgh, ex capitale siderurgica riconvertita allo sviluppo di scienze e tecnologia, ospita importanti sedi universitarie e migliaia di studenti da ogni dove, stranieri, loro i primi a dire questi manifesti ci piacciono. I Our neighbors are very nice. Quando li ho visti per la prima volta ho pensato i nostri vicini di casa sono così carini, così accoglienti, sono certa che se provassi a bussare loro la porta li accoglierebbero a braccia aperte. Io amo vivere qui. Quando ho visto i manifesti ho pensato che le persone attorno a me sono friendly, amichevoli, aperte. Mi piace questo posto. Yeah, I like this place. Pittsburgh quindi città accogliente aperta? Tutto vero, dice il pastore Dave Swason, che però ricorda, dietro alla parola ci deve essere l'azione. Um, questa è una piccola cosa, vendere i pannelli per 10 dollari al pezzo, ma è un modo per dire no all'ingiustizia. Allo stesso tempo però dobbiamo impegnarci concretamente ad avere una relazione vera con le persone diverse da noi, arabi latini, italiani, come lei. Io penso che le cose che veramente contano sono scritte nel cartello, ma se non agiamo rimane solo un cartello. Ok, molti di voi hanno capito, per questo ho mostrato tutto il video, ma scusate, è perché vedo molti di voi. Ok.
can understand. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's all right. Okay, let me bring it up and then we'll try to just switch the game once it should be. Just see if it works. The, this is the. That was fun, and it was aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Um, <laughs> mine is kind of boring. Um, <laughs> it's, um, but I do, um, but I do want to talk about Rai. And um, I uh, told Stacy that I would give a sort of a larger uh, uh, cultural context, a little bit of historical facts, and. Uh, um, and about, you know, what Rai, you know, this public television, television station has meant uh, for Italian society um, throughout the years. So I want to go to the, uh, to the slideshow. Here it is. Here I am. Okay. Slideshow. Uh, do that. Che torno. Ritorno sullo slideshow e faccio from beginning. Eccolo qua. Sì, no, it's okay. You know. Not totally. A total idiot. But um, so, uh, first of all, a couple of words about myself. I am uh, from Rome. I'm from Rome, Italy. I'm Italian. I've been in the United States for 31 years, mm. since 1987. And... Um, all my degrees are in French. I'm a professor of uh, French and Italian at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, um, what interests me is the relationship between culture, politics, and artistic forms in general. Um, so, um, so this is the title of my presentation, Between Pedagogy and National Unity. Rai and Italian society. And I hope that uh, I will make this title clear. I want to, what I'm going to try to do is to explain this title. So, as Anna has already said, uh, Rai starts, like in America, right? It, it starts as a radio broadcasting service um, uh, in uh, 1924. In 1924, the country is still officially a monarchy. We have a king, you know, king of Italy, a queen. But fascism was in power. Um, Italy was starting to become an industrialized nation, mostly in the north. Big companies that you have heard of are Fiat and Olivetti. Uh, those are big companies. And then there were smaller. Uh, the south, um, oh. There is a microphone. Uh, the South is mostly rural. Um, the country speaks many different dialects. Um, so what does this radio um, provide to Italian society? Entertainment, there is a lot of singing, a lot of songs, you know, s contexts, uh, political news, uh, and propaganda. Uh, of course, all the speeches of Mussolini were promptly broadcasted. Uh, but uh, it was like in America. There was a radio in every family that belonged, let's say, from the lower middle classes upwards, right? So it was an important um, presence. Um, there was only one channel. In 1946, uh, there were three radio channels. 
1946, for the first time, Italy becomes a republic. You know what I mean? It's like it was uh, a constitutional monarchy since the 1900, 19, um, 1861. I'll go back to that later. Um, but after uh, the fall of fascism, there was this need to create a cultural, political unity. And so there was, even on the radio, there was a lot of educational programming aiming at unifying regional, you know, you've seen even today all the different regions in Italy, regional and political differences. Um, in January 1954, the first television channel began broadcasting. Uh, again, it was entertainment, news, sport, the great unifier in Italy, soccer, but also um, cycling, ciclismo. Um, th those were great moments um, of national unity. Also, one cannot, ca one cannot forget, it's very important, that at the time, Italy is a sort of coveted social and political space during the Cold War. You see where Italy is, in the very middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, for, for the, it was a strategic country for the United States. The United States, for at least 30 years, was extremely invested in Italian culture, Italian politics. Italy, of course, was also a, um, a new market, right? We were a poor country, a country that was reconstructing itself. So the US were important, were an important presence. And so even for the television broadcasting, like starting the programming, uh, the model of the USA uh, was important. You know, we had the equivalent of Lucille Ball, like Sandra Mondaini, and the Italians will remember these kind of things. You know, so th th it was a really important model. Um, as I repeat, in the 50s and 60s, Italy is still a new republic. The cultural and, and economic separation between North and South is still strong. Um, the Christian Democrat Party, known as DC, now defunct, uh, controls the government. Um, why do I say this? Because people make fun of Italy. People say, oh, you know, there is People, they have uh, a government crisis three times a year. Yeah, but that was all appearance. A go you know, a particular government would fall, other people would go up, but in fact, for 30 years, Italy was super stable, was the Christian Democrats. So Rai um, promotes the values of the Catholic ethics and the necessity for the people to identify more with their nation. This is a country that's regionalized. It's also separated politically, but I don't want to go into that. But there are a few things that, are, that have a strong presence in Italy. One was the Catholic Church, which was present at the capillary level, like with parishes, neighborhood parishes. You go every Sunday and the priest talks to you and your children go to play soccer in the, um, in the parish field. And also, so in a way, one wanted to have common values and also they wanted people to become more involved with national life. Um, still in the 1920s, intellectuals thought that Italy did not have a truly national popular culture in terms of literature and theater. Like in France, they had Victor Hugo, like Les Mis, you know, Les Miserables, or um, um, in Russia, they had the great uh, novelists like Tolstoy. And, but in Italy, uh, a little bit because of illiteracy and for other reasons, uh, because it was a country that had unified later, a true national popular culture seemed to be lacking. Um, of course, in the, in the 20th century, cinema starts to fill that place because to go to the movies, you don't need to really know how to read and write very well. You know, 
you can go there and you can appreciate uh, something made for a larger public, for people who might not come from very privileged background. When television um, came about, television also wanted to fill that space, you know. And so since I'm into literature, uh, I have, um, I'm, um, I'm going to say, you know, that Italian literary tradition came alive through television, right? So in the 19th century, a few writers did try to create national novels, preparing the people for the unification that actually came about in 1861. Um, these works afterwards were taught in the national public school system. I will only, there are a few, but of course I should have talked about Dante, but what? Anyway, but I'm only going to talk about one, which is I Promessi Sposi, the betrothed, the fi um, i fidanzati, le fiancé, right? By Alessandro Manzoni. Um, everyone who has gone to school in Italy has read this, has heard about it. What is this? It's a novel. It's a wide reflection on the Italian character, like the characters are supposed to have the weaknesses and the virtues of the Italian people, uh, the Catholic faith. The, the issue of faith is central to the book. Social injustice, rich and poor, aristocrats and peasants, and political struggles, there are riots that are portrayed in the novel. So the novel really tries to give, it's one of those 19th century novel, like War and Peace, you know, that try to give a wide uh, fresco. The interesting, you see that I have two dates for the novel. I have 1827 and 1840. I just say this because the edition of 1827 was written in a language that was closer to the Milanese, to the Milan native dialect of the author himself. But he understood that these regional dialects needed to be overcome, that one needed to create an Italian literature that everybody could read, and so the poor guy, he spent actual time um, to correct his own Italian, to start creating what eventually did become a standard Italian style. It's interesting because this was one uh, of the most successful adaptations uh, of um, televised uh, adaptations in 1967. Uh, it was broadcasted, this uh, adaptation, and it was a great success. It was produced and received as a promotion of Italian and Catholic values, uh, religious values, Christian values. And um, it was important. And here it is, I just show you um, the, the beautiful, the two guys are the betrothed, right? But all sort of things happen to them. They're poor and there is a rich aristocrat who wants to basically have his way with this girl. She's kidnapped, <laughs> she's kidnapped, um, she's put under, this, under the, surveil the surveillance of a corrupted nun. <laughs> La Monaca di Monza, uh, the guy tries to um, look for her, goes all over, goes to Milan, and there is the uh, plague in Milan. Eventually, the aristocrat dies of the plague, like he deserved, and uh, these two good peasants, good good Christians do get married, and at the end, they have beautiful children. <laughs> it's, it's a masterpiece. I don't want you to think that there is anything in this novel that is cliché. It's a novel that holds its own uh, against any French 
or Russian or English classic or American classic. Um, but there is a strong pedagogical educational content to it. And the thing is that people liked it. The audience was super high. Well, there was also only one channel, but, <laughs> but still. <laughs> uh, still, it was important. I don't want to, okay. And so I said, uh, there, there weren't that many Italian novels. This is, was one of the few Italian novels. And so a lot of adaptations were of, were of foreign classics as European references. From the 1950s up to the early 1970s, we saw adaptations of all the major Dostoevsky novels. You name them, there is a wonderful adaptation. The Idiot, The Brothers Karamazov, you say it, we, we have it. Uh, and then a lot of other European and American classics, Little Women, of course, Wuthering Heights, Pride and Prejudice, Les Miserables. And this is really interesting because thanks to this uh, mass media, which is television, a lot of theater actors that people normally wouldn't see became household names. And also television for some of them provided an access to cinema. Uh, and these people are known nationally, right? And paradoxically, something like a shared popular literature or literary imagination or a, an affective relationship to a literary past emerges through television. So who said that television kills the book? Not in Italy. Um, it's an interesting thing. And the people who uh, are old enough uh, to remember these wonderful adaptations, they understand. So I was born in 1962. We loved television. I love TV. And even today, I'm totally dependent. <laughs> Totally, completely, you know. I don't watch a lot of it, very selective, but I have to watch it. That you can't, no. So, I was born in 1962, so I don't remember, like the I Promessi Sposi that came out in 67, I don't remember the original broadcasting, but as you can imagine, these pieces were recycled. You know, once you have this kind of production, you rebroadcast it every two years. And so these are important, I think, to me, but not only to me, I think to a lot of Italian um, subjects. So that was a way to create a national identity. But then there is also an, another way to create identity, and that is to brand recognition, right? Uh, Italian culture also became more commercially unified, right? Um, in other words, what happened after the Second World War? We, crea we tried to create a national identity through literature, culture, but people got also unified through the market, branding, right? Um, also, the people who are old enough to remember will remember Carosello, which was uh, a, um, um, a show that was broadcasted between 8.50 and 9 p.m. Um, this was just, these were just commercials. It's like commercials for Tide, but they were all compressed into this 10-minute space, and these commercials were artistically produced, um, I, children, me, <laughs> would go to bed after Carosello. <laughs> Dopo Carosello vai a letto, 9 p.m. <laughs> Brands like um, Ace, which was the, well, I don't even want to know. Brands became household names, jingles were memorized. And the jingle for Carosello, I could sing. Pa, 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 pa. So anyway, this, uh, so, okay. I wanted to, to introduce a light note. How does, how do people come together? Like it or not, uh, 
the brands that we remember, the jingles that we have memorized, also create uh, identity. So this was, these were the, um, this was the time when uh, Rai had the monopoly of broadcasting in Italy. But uh, then uh, there was a deregulation and privatization, um, starting with some cable stations in the early 1970s. Rai loses its monopoly on television broadcasting. First it happened via Cavo cable, but then um, in 1976 uh, the airwaves um, were opened up. And this, all, this was the same for radio, right? Both television and radio became, um, um, were opened up uh, in Italy. Um, First, what happened was the creation of a multiplicity of local stations. First, the regional waves were made available. This is how Silvio Berlusconi starts. He starts in Milan and then acquires Italia Uno and Rete Quattro from previous owners. Uh, in 1984, an important date, private stations can broadcast nationally. So that opens um, really the national market. Um, and it is a new era in television culture. Um, with Rai, you knew that the government was behind it. You know what I mean? You knew that there was a political and pedagogical and cultural uh, program behind it. Finally, these were programs that you more or less voted for, right? Um, also, different political trends uh, were represented in the Rai. There were leftist parties, leftist channels, <laughs> uh, more moderate channels. So in other words, it you knew what you were in for, you know, you knew that Yes, you know, it's always the same morality, but at least you chose it somehow. But now the access to political influence through television and commercial domination becomes more and more detached from your actual choice. It becomes um, some sort of big brother, right? It becomes controlled by um, different uh, groups. Um, so one could say that what happens in the 1980s is that we, there is still a pedagogy, there is still some sort of education or brainwashing maybe that occurs, you know, through the airwaves. Um, but what I want to say, and it's not, you know, the morality of the Catholic Church and the civic engagement of the first Italian political leaders were reflected in the Rai programming until the mid-1980s. You could find them quaint or outdated, but there was something tangible there. Another culture is spread by the TV empire of, Sel of Silvio Berlusconi. Uh, a minimum common denominator is, crea is created to variety shows. Um, sexist displays of women bodies, um, extremely commercialized programming, and then the creation of news broadcasting tied to the interests of Berlusconi himself, right? Because when um, news are broadcasted in these private channels, they more or less represent certain interests. Um, although an important political figure since the late 1980s and prime minister for many years, Berlusconi somehow, you know, there were, were, was allowed to keep his broadcasting empire. People are familiar with his values and embrace his politics. In other words, after 20 years of watching certain kind of television, 
people feel familiar, people, um, dare I say, like him just out of um, familiarity, right? And, and so they are ready to embrace his politics and his politics are not the politics that you think about as politics, his politics are basically commercial interests, right? What is politic? It's the imposition of one's own interests. What is politics? Politics is the promotion and the struggle for dominance. It's no longer, you know, the promotion of a program of a certain worldview, of a certain morality, of a certain social message. So, um, if we are in the time, in the era of post-politics, I just ask these questions, are we also in the era of post-television? Um, so in Italy, as elsewhere, the democratic and political values of what has been called the First Republic, you know, uh, seem to be in crisis. From a point of view of uh, information, news sources multiply, entertainment becomes parceled through pay channels and social media, right? So it's, you cannot see television, I cannot see television anymore, or the media anymore, much as vehicles of national identity. I might be wrong, but it's not a unified national identity. It's, there is a new cultural and political landscape that is taking shape, plus television might be losing its centrality in providing a platform for cultural unity, my children don't watch television. They just don't. They have their own um, social networks. There are good and bad consequences to this evolution that are very hard to predict. And um, uh, it seems that, uh, I think that Mark Twain said that um, pronostication is very hard to do uh, mostly when it is about the future. And so I'm going to stop it here. Okay, thank you. We have plenty of time for questions for both Anna and GSF Pina. Do you want to both, you both stand up here in the front? Yeah, if you want to. Hi. Hello. Okay. So, uh, who has questions for either? Uh, Anna, could you tell us about Ray's online presence? Uh, what kind of, you know, online does it, you know, pages does it have? Uh, could you tell us? About Ray? Sorry, about Ray. Which yeah. kind of presence there is about la online? Yeah. online. Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> so, um, we do have a website. We have uh, three most important channels, Rai 1, Rai 2, Rai 3, and then uh, other 13, cha no, 12 channels as well. And um, we have, but we don't have a, a good communication, unified communication online, unfortunately. And that's something new. That's not new, but it's something about my company's uh, studying in this moment. So we start a lot of things uh, online. I mean, uh, a lot of websites and a lot of uh, um, Facebook profile. And, uh, you know, my regional station, not Trieste, but the um, uh, broadcaster of all the local stations, uh, starts now to have uh, a unified uh, website and Facebook profile. But in this moment, just young journalists like I am, <laughs> <No>. okay. <laughs> just uh, young journalists are working in that way, but it's not an official way. So we are doing Facebook profile, uh, but uh, we are doing by ourselves. So I mean, uh, I like to do that. I want to do that because I'm in the area and I want to speak to everybody. And because uh, your kids doesn't 
watch TV, don't watch television. So I, I have to do that. But it's something that we want to do. But uh, the company, you have to understand that in Italy, um, trade unions are very strong. So the company has to mediate with the um, trade unions. And this is a, a process who is starting now. And that's very late. So you can see a lot of things uh, about Rai in a lot of websites. I don't, I can't tell you. Okay, you have to go to www. Uh, point no dot rai dot com. There is this website, but maybe there are others. I can't um, explain very well that. And now there is a, a wonderful app. Rai uh, did, uh, I think, one year so one year ago. So that's something new. Very well done for. Um, uh, important product, product, I mean, series TV uh, for um, um, Festival di Sanremo, it's our important uh, um, appointment uh, about music, Italian music. Uh, you have, you can uh, see this uh, app is really well done, but there is no news inside. So all the time something starts, but not in a unified way. So. That's our problem now. That's why I tried to visit it, uh, to uh, visit um, a television company to understand how they work uh, in that um, field. And uh, you are very strong because maybe you started before. Because um, I don't know. I saw difference between uh, um, public television and also in that. Uh, part, public television and private television, and private television are really well organized. And that's what uh, I was looking for. I wanted to know how they do that. Public television here has played a, a strong educational role, ex, you know, explicitly. So, is that the case with Rai at all? Yes. In the yeah. past, uh, I think uh, Giuseppina explained very well, and uh, in the past it was like that, and also now. I mean, uh, we are a public television, and we speak about some argument that is not so cool for private television. And I saw here the same because I attend to a program here in WQED. It was a, a live progr program. About, uh, the name is Think, and it was about poverty in Pennsylvania. And I said, maybe a private television doesn't speak about this because it's not cool, it's not beautiful, it's, it's sad. We do the same. Yes, yes, yes. There are there were a lot, and in fact, uh, when I was growing up in the afternoon, uh, I think it was between three and six. There was what we called La TV de Ragazzi, the TV for kids, and there were educational programmings. Um, um, there were. Uh, Yes, it was protected. It was, and I'm talking. So I'm born. I was born in '62. So I'm talking about the late '60s, the early '70s. There was a lot of uh, of uh, pro programming for children, uh, a lot. Um, and I think that some still exists. But um, yes, some still exists. And I also want to say that. Um, during the TV de Ragazzi, during that kind of programming, um, sometimes we also watched some uh, American uh, productions for young people and teenagers. I remember like horses, I don't know, I these uh, TV shows, Furia, Cavallo, Happy Days. <laughs> But before happy days, uh, Lassie, Lassie, Lassie come home, torna a casa Lassie. Um, <laughs> what else was it? Um, Zorro, da, um, and that was safe programming. And uh, channels for kids. We have 15 channels, and I think three or four are for kids. So for kids. Uh, um, like age of my daughters, so zero until five, and then uh, for bigger, and then for bigger again for teenagers. So we have a good program programmation uh, with a. Yeah. It's it's very comparable to uh, WQED and all the other. Uh, yeah. I have three very short questions. 
it's all of them for, for Anna. Uh, what I was curious to see if you track down the areas where design is posted or not, and if you have gone throughout Pittsburgh versus just the, the, the neighborhoods that might be close to where you live, or uh, just to get a different perspective of uh, the different layers that this city offers that to some uh, might not become obvious un uh, unless you do spend time in uh, different neighborhoods. So that was one. The second one is what type of news do you cover back in Italy? Um, and three, what are the plans? You have a, a few weeks left here in Pittsburgh. What's your, on your agenda? Thank you. So um, I saw uh, these signs, honestly, everywhere. I mean, I don't have ca we don't have a car here. So we walk a lot and we take buses all the time. But I visited a lot and sometimes I take, I rent a car just to visit Pittsburgh. Like uh, two weeks ago, I went to Northside and went in that area just to visit Pittsburgh because I love to do that. I'm happy and uh, lucky. So, uh, and I saw, not here in downtown maybe, Sometimes, yes, in the windows of uh, some stores, I saw that. But uh, on the um, billette, so beautiful <laughs> and nice houses, I um, saw a lot of them. So I think it's uh, something people are sharing, I think, in Pittsburgh and not only in Pittsburgh, because uh, uh, last, week, uh, uh, last weekend I went to Philadelphia and I saw in Philadelphia too. So the same and sometimes not the same uh, with other colors, uh, with maybe other background, but uh, the same meaning. And um, about, uh, um, uh, I uh, so I work uh, for a local uh, newscaster, so I have to cover everything uh, from politics to sometimes sport also if I am not so good. and. Uh, all kind of news, uh, a lot of story. I love to uh, do story about people. So for Rai Due, a national uh, channel, I do um, short documentary too about story about people. So sometimes something happen in your country, but you can um, in your area, uh, but you can uh, um, explain what is happening using a story of a person. So I like to do that, and uh, I used to do that. And uh, when I do that, uh, I try to share with the national uh, um, channel my stories. And uh, But I have to cover all kind of news. So sometimes also murders <laughs> or, you know, politics events, something like that. And about my stay here, I have one more month. And um, I'm studying English. Uh, thanks, it's incredible. There is, uh, maybe you know this association, GPLC. And I'm, you know, mm, yes. Uh, very good. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, um, following some English class, thanks to them. Uh, free English class, but really well done with the uh, um, volunteer uh, tutors, uh, and uh, um, that's my <laughs> main target to improve my English in the last months. And also, I'm following uh, Helen class, uh, and I'm attending her class. Uh, and she uh, teach in it about Italian media and Italian culture in her class, and um, uh, it's an opportunity for me to see how Americans um, look. Us, and to hear these students, young students, who they explain uh, what they are studying about my country, I think uh, it's precious. It's a great opportunity. So I'm happy to continue to um, attend uh, her class like a student. I don't want to speak anymore. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> but um, uh, so that's, I, I think it's interesting. And um, it's an opportunity. I'm curious for everything. And uh, if I find another story, maybe I can, uh, uh, the last story I did, uh, it was not that one I showed you, but uh, um, a story ba about uh, a Italian school in Pittsburgh, uh, a daycare in it. In it with the Italian teachers, mother langu language teacher, 
uh, teachers and um, it was interesting uh, and I did this story last week uh, and uh, I will show it in Italy on our channel and um, if I find something else maybe I can do that but uh, I explained to um, Elena and in her class uh, that I I'm understanding doing uh, this stuff, uh, this story by myself with my iPhone and, and my iPad. That's very cool to do that and I'm proud of myself because uh, I'm older than that student so I'm not so good with technology but I'm doing by myself this and I'm proud of me but at the same time I understand that that's not a good way to do that I mean uh, in Italy I have uh, a cameraman and uh, an editor and we work in three people maybe three people are too much for a piece but one person one man band is too too is too little and uh, you know, now my uh, bosses in Italy are so happy I did that and they said, wow, you have to show, you have to do that. Uh, and now I'm thinking, no, because maybe <laughs> after I have to do and uh, you know, you know, but the problem is that it's not because I don't want to work, be because I think it's not well done. I, m I mean, um, you know, it's hard for me to explain in English, but I asked to WQED to see how they do uh, digital content. So, for not for television, but just for website and uh, Facebook profile and uh, um, no, they don't have app, no. But uh, website and Facebook profile, they used to have uh, um, a small uh, troop. I mean, uh, small. Um, a small team. A small team. A small team. So two journalists who shoot and uh, edit and uh, write a piece, but they are two. And they go outside and they do, I uh, had the opportunity to see how they work outside and then see what they realized. And uh, um, honestly, it was well done better than I'm doing by myself because I'm, I'm not able to shoot. I have never studied that. And uh, I see here in this school, uh, honestly, today uh, brilliant students uh, um, showed me uh, this place and they have uh, honestly more than uh, I could do in the past. Uh, they can understand and they can learn how to shoot, how to edit, uh, uh, but you can do, you can do everything. Helen was going to explain, I, I can tell you what we're doing. I should let the students do this, shouldn't I? They're all just sitting here. Uh, I teach a class, and this will be our 11th trip overseas. Uh, it's called International Media, and we visit different countries. So what we do before is we prepare ourselves as much as we can, which is never enough, uh, before we visit. This will be the second time we've been to Italy. We were there in 2010. I have 26 okay. students, mm -hmm. um, and Anna has been helping us. And we know uh, we're gonna go to Rome, Assisi, Florence, Venice, Milan. Last time we went south. This time we're gonna keep going north. My my choice <laughs> it's one of those but we're going to uh, go to La Repubblica we're going to the Vatican Media we're going to Anel thanks Diana uh, to see the in-house TV station they have there and one other possible PR place we start always with a professor's uh, lecture we're, and that's through the American University of Rome and I forget the adjunct's name um, and then we're gonna stop in a CCB because it's just too beautiful to pass up. <laughs> it's just too gorgeous. Then we'll go to Florence. I don't think we're going to have time for media visits there. We get to Milan. We're going to Hearst Magazines, Hearst Italia, and we're going to Burson Marsteller there, an office, a PR agency, and possibly one more. And we're, we hope we're going to connect with Anna in her home country. So we're really excited about that. And we'll mix that in with some cultural visits um, as much as we can. And we pack it in and like what, 13 days. Uh, we leave May 5th, we'll be back on May the 18th. So um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I, we've been doing this. Last year we were in Iceland and Ireland. So, and that was the second trip. We're starting to repeat countries because I'm much older than Anna. <laughs> <laughs> but we, it's been a joy to have you come to our class and she knows that. That would be a good segue. Do, you, do the students have any questions? That's what I wanted to. Well, think of some. <laughs> Did you have a question? If they, yeah, I have a. <laughs> if they have a question, I give you. Yeah. I have just a, a kind of comment. Uh, um, well, first of all, thank you for both presentations. Actually, I enjoy very much. 
very much both also the little story about the, uh, the poster here. Uh, so my question is kind of related to um, what uh, Giuseppina said about uh, the beginning of the Italian uh, you know, TV and uh, the fact that it was basically a monopoly. And there was a monopoly for, uh, for a long period of time. So um, I am the same age of Giuseppina, so I remember uh, those times very well. I mean, not the beginning, of course, but even uh, the, you know, the 70s. The reruns. Until, <laughs> until, <laughs> well, until Berlusconi yeah. and media yeah. set actually yeah. started. And uh, of course, I was little and young. I didn't realize that uh, there was a monopoly, and um, it was just OK. But when I moved here, I moved in 95, uh, so pretty much uh, the same, uh, uh, well, maybe a little later than Giuseppina. But uh, I had the feeling that, wow, here they really have a bunch of <laughs> channels and everything, and uh, definitely not a monopoly of uh, news. And I mean, you can really pick and choose or whatever you like. The problem is that uh, it's just a different <laughs> kind of monopoly. And my example is actually very actual, uh, like these days uh, with uh, the Olympic Games. Oh, I'm okay. literally furious. <laughs> and that's the reason why I really wanted to share this, because uh, uh, so the American public have this uh, only one uh, broadcast, which is NBC, that bought uh, the rights uh, to really you know, share uh, the Olympic the Games, which by definition mm. should be international, should be really enforcing the community mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the discovery, mm -hmm. and uh, the knowledge of the other countries, and language, and abilities, and skills. And I don't know if you had any chance to actually watch NBC, but it's a disaster. It's really like a propaganda of uh, these countries only. And then read a little bit because, uh, I mean, of course I cheer US, like uh, I'm of course an American citizen, so I definitely wanted to cheer my country. But I wanted to know also something else. I mean, I remember as a child, uh, even the medal ceremony was educational because I remember we learned about uh, the, the, you the, know, the hymns, national the different anthems. And the different ways that to handle the things, or even, even sports that uh, in my country were not uh, even, you know, and the idea that, wow, there is also these things and that thing was extremely educational and fun uh, and beautiful. And uh, so, I'm sorry, going back no, no, uh, to, no. to my question, I don't really, fact, but I, I just would like uh, to hear uh, your, uh, you know, impression about the fact that it's really, even the monopoly, it's not really a fact or a statement, it's more uh, how people um, receive them. Like uh, when I speak with my colleagues or my friends uh, here, they just don't complain. Like uh, I don't think they even realize what I'm saying. And because say, have never seen just because it's a private monopoly doesn't mean that it's good. Just because they paid for the rights doesn't mean that it's good. Like uh, there is this tendency to say, oh, government is bad uh, and private is good because they probably had, uh, you know, a, an opportunity to, uh, I mean, Whatever they were just good to get uh, that uh, you know chance, uh, and I just would like to hear your impressions because uh, it's just something you know. Wow. Sorry, for the that's interesting. Honestly, that's interesting. I'm not. Um, I'm not watching uh, Olympic games just because um, mm, we don't. Uh, we are not watching a lot of TV because uh, I, I think you can understand. But my girls watch cartoon, English cartoon, so I leave them <laughs> to do that. So this is the period when uh, I don't watch a lot of TV, so I don't know. But I read how the behavior of uh, American government uh, there, of the uh, vice president of the United States there. So I, I read uh, on the articles or newspapers, and I saw um, that mm, um, they don't want to share this idea about uh, unified Korea. I mean, uh, good relationship between uh, uh, North Korea and South Korea. They don't want to show that. Uh, just that, that is just what I read in American newspapers and Italian newspapers, too. I used to read the uh, uh, New York Times here in the library, and um, it's they, they speak uh, out without problem, I think, here about that, about the behavior of the vice president uh, in that case. Uh, 
So about television, I don't know, but that's very interesting uh, to me. Thanks, uh, because I will pay attention about that. I didn't know, and that's inter interesting to. Mm. But I think that um, it's, it's not only the Olympics, right? I mean, for people who have grown who have grown up in other countries and watching uh, international sport events uh, in different cultures, it's th it's completely different. The World Cup, for instance, soccer. Um, it's the same here. There is a strong monopoly, and they only show certain games, and people go crazy, you know, because you can't watch a game the way it's supposed to be watched. Um, yeah, it's a monopoly in the sense that if you buy the rights, you have the monopoly on that specific event, and that is the way it is. And um, yeah. What can I say? It exists. It's true. Uh. Uh, I'm just curious about oh, about if there's hot button issues in mm -hmm. Italy. Like here, we have really hot button issues that really divide us. Mm. Gun control, women's rights. You know, um, I'm and and more so now than ever, um, more people are saying in the United States, you know, he's not my president. There's a real division now in our country that I've never seen in um, uh, the last 40 years that I've been able to vote. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, when you were talking about the television, that kind of matches what is it? Is it does it divide? What are the hot button issues in Italy? I would say that the hot button issue is uh, is really immigration. Is what Anna showed. That is probably. Uh, would you say that that's maybe the most divisive issue yes, in Italy? Sure. Probably, I would say. Anything that's else true, that goes that comes close to that besides immigration? Too, I you. Yeah, but that too. yeah, that's it, that interests oh, yeah. just a small that population, I think. But I would say that immigration is probably the hot on hot button issue, and this is where people try to pull um, this is where populism and, and sort of neo-fascist tendencies aggregate around. It's the issue really of immigration. Uh, everything else, um, maybe it's not as divisive no. as, as it is here. For sure. And right. so, you know, it's not an immigration like people, like in the past and also here, um, come and try to work and to steal. They, right party can say that still work uh, to Italian people or American people. It's different because these people are coming and they can't work. They can't do anything. So they stay, they walk around the cities. I can't, um, it's hard to explain to you that, but a uh, huge mass, mass of people are coming and they can't work because uh, there is a um, um, uh, European system who protect them because they are refugees. They can't work uh, and they s walk around with the, their telephone uh, and people are scared in this moment because they, they can't do anything. They live together in uh, old um, jail, jails, old jails, old building uh, and they live together. They are not segregated of course, they are not uh, in jail, so they can move and they can do what they want, but they are not paid. The association who uh, uh, take care of them are paid by government, like 35 euros a refugee, so there is big a day, business a day. a day, there is big business behind that. And uh, um, so for people, for Italian people, they think, why? They are, they they have a house where live. I mean, not a house. They, they have, have a, a they have a roof. Uh, they have a roof. They have a, a bed. They have something to eat. Uh, they don't. Yes, they don't. Um, 
they don't work, uh, and um, because they can't work, because they don't have insurance to work, it's a very strong and hard process for them. And so they walk around cities. So I think it happens in Italy, but all over Europe. And to manage this situation, it's really it's incredible I, I, um, and uh, it's hard for us uh, for journalists to explain this because um, um, if you if you say that they are wondering you can say that because that's why you say that so if you say that some um, city hall decided to involve them uh, in uh, a work uh, like a social work just to involve them in something uh, people can s say, but there is crisis in Italy, and uh, I won't work for the city hall. <laughs> Why they work for city hall, and they are paid maybe a little bit, they do something for uh, mm, the public system. I can do that. So it's very hard for us to, to explain this situation. <laughs> and some, and, and there was also, there, there were also some bad facts about them, uh, the murder I told you before, but that's not the only one because these people are doing nothing and so some of them uh, make uh, crime. Uh, they yeah, so I would say that there, is, there are different approaches to this immigration issue and this is where the separation in society is most visible right now. But there are other issues which are hot button in the States that are sort of ignored or really second class in Italy. There is no longer a real public divisive, for instance, discussion about legal abortion. It's, there is some, there is, uh, there are, there is the issue of, uh, the peop the doctors who don't want to perform ab uh, abortions for uh, moral and religious reasons, um, but, uh, but not on the population. But not mm. yeah. But the people are really not divided again. You know, around that. Why? While here there is a strong political, but there is not a strong political debate among the people. Um, what else? It's a hot button issue here. Same-sex marriage a little bit, but not that much, because nobody made a big point, really, about it. Um, well, we still don't have same-sex marriage. We have uh, convivenza civile. We have a, sor a civil, um, a s sort of a civil uh, contract that allows same-sex couples the same civic rights, like in terms of medical assistance, pension, Things like that. Yeah, but it's not. It's but it's not a hot button issue. It's not something that people really are completely divided about. I would say that immigration is the one really sore point. But I think that we cannot stress enough uh, the tragedy that is occurring in Italy right now. Um, places that were known for their beauty, like in Sicily, islands like the island of Lampedusa. These are now islands where thousands of refugees are housed, where dead bodies are washed on the shores. Um, the Mediterranean Sea which is a place of beauty and culture, uh, is a cemetery, it's a grave. Um, there are thousands of bodies right now in, this, in the Mediterranean. And for a, for a country like Italy, this causes a huge ethical and political problem. Italy cannot do it alone. Um, Migrants don't necessarily want to stay in Italy, but they come to Italy. Um, uh, the first door, just for that reason. It's like Greece a little bit, right? Then there is the other route, which is through the Balkans, right? There is the sea, and then there are the Balkans. But, um, yeah, it is a hot-bottom issue 
because it's a huge tragedy that Italian society cannot handle, basically. More questions? No, they're not, because there is no European uh, uni uh, Europe has not been able to have a serious political debate about this. Um, and also, in Europe, there are countries which are um, <laughs> which are not progressive, like France. Um, there, there are uh, right-wing parties which are represented in the European Parliament who have very reactionary views about immigration. They, <coughs> they certainly just want to send, I'm sorry, <coughs> they just want to send everyone back. It's not clear where, back where, but, um, you know, it's, um, so no, there is no political will on the part of Europe to really uh, handle the problem. And um, yeah, uh, so the answer is no, because there is no political will. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we I, we are trying not to. I think that we try to give an idea of what is happening, and uh, I'm not saying that um, people are killed, that people of color or immigrants are killed in Italy because Italians are crazy racists. You know what I mean? There are crazy racists in Italy, but there is also a problem that is not being addressed, right? That's and it's a problem that, in a way, is beyond uh, the financial uh, and, um, I would say, even social and spatial resources of Italy alone. Um, it's, it's just sad. It's just sad. If you have seen Sicily 20 years ago and you go to Sicily now, you want to cry, basically. If you have been to Lampedusa, 20 years ago and you go to Lampedusa today, um, yeah, the, the, you, you want to cry, basically. Yes, uh, you know, you have uh, um, all news uh, system, uh, and that's something we um, kept in the past uh, from United States. It's another way to do journalism uh, and to have newscaster. So uh, we are doing that in Italy too, but not too much. And people, for the moment, are not so uh, 
uh, fascinated by uh, all news system. All news system, it's interesting because you can have when you want, like uh, internet, I mean, uh, uh, on TV. So it's very uh, useful, practical, and um, easy to have. But at the same time, you don't have, uh, um, you can't focus on something. So um, I think. I see all news uh, all the time, uh, repeat, 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 short pieces, repeat, 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 and then I see again and I, I see again, maybe with some news, uh, with, uh, you know, the uh, some news inside the piece, but uh, not long story in on the newscaster. You can see, you can see, of course, on WQED when they do big uh, reportage, I mean, uh, documentary, and, uh, but, um, and we used to do that on Rai. So we used to do that on our main uh, newscaster. And uh, the newscaster you watched when you uh, were younger uh, at 8 o'clock in the evening is the main newscaster in Italy also right now. I mean, uh, uh, and in that newscaster, uh, maybe 20 minutes of news, you can see not only the uh, short story about what is happening today, but uh, also a story behind the person, uh, a story behind uh, uh, also what I uh, do in Trieste, because uh, uh, I think it's totally different the way. I don't know if it's better or not. Maybe I am, um, I uh, grew up in that way, so I like that. Um, that's totally different. And I saw here when I watch TV, not a lot, but when I do, uh, I don't see it on television, but I see on the newspapers, not a lot of international news. I mean, uh, a lot of American topics, of course, and that's normal, but not a lot. What is happening in Europe, you can see too much. I mean, a little bit of Brexit, of course, because it's a, an economical issue, but other topics I don't see. On newspaper, yeah, I see. I read uh, um, a lot of interesting uh, uh, long article about what is happening in Europe, what is happening uh, all over the world. Another thing that I wanted to say that still exists in Italy is Sunday morning programming, right? And on Rai, the Sunday morning programming is really interesting because it's uh, it's um, <laughs> it's a sort of a well, it's it's slightly different from morning TV in the United States. There is more content in a way. There is a lot of coverage of regional uh, events, festivals. Uh, cultural manifestations. Um, so Sunday morning programming, I think in Italy, it's important. And there is more content than what is done in the morning in the United States. And I think that without going into great detail, I think it's um, uh, there is a real insularity to American uh, culture. Um, um, I don't know, maybe it's the uh, blindness of the giant, right? You know, you're such a giant that you can afford to not see what the small people are doing. You know, it's a sort of a, um, yeah, I would say that. You're so big, right? You, you think you have so much control that what these other people around the world are doing cannot really touch you and you will look at them if you feel threatened and when you feel threatened. So I don't know. I don't want to go into depth. I mean, it's this is not really the, the forum to have a big political discussion about this. Um, I have a question on fake news. Oh. Which I never heard, you know, uh, th three years ago I never heard of that term. <laughs> what was fake news? Well, now fake news apparently is something that if, if, if it's not in your echo chamber, if you don't believe it, it's fake. Do you have that same issue in Italy, in yes. Italian? Yes, of, of course. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have, of course, and that's why uh, for our 
mm, that's an opportunity for uh, social media now to take uh, our political campaign, uh, Italian political campaign, and see if they can manage in a good way this fake news. Uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of fake news, and uh, what I said before is that Facebook decide to uh, to do that, so to uh, try to find this uh, uh, hoax, hoax, right? Buffalo hoax, and uh, using people. I mean, uh, if I I am I have my uh, Facebook profile, and I read something strange about um, politics in this case, about the campaign, and I think uh, mm, that's strange. That's true. I can uh, uh, make like a signal, signal. And say um, uh, that something strange, and the fact checkers uh, who are from an agency, not from Facebook, uh, are doing that and see if it's true or not. That's something new. Uh, it's happening in Italy. I think I'm proud that it's happening in Italy, but I don't think it's Italy. It's just because uh, there are the campaign now here, there, and uh, uh, um, and that's an opportunity to do that in a good moment. I don't know if the war work. Well, actually, now they say that Facebook uh, and Twitter also employ fact checkers. So that's not the thing is that there are too few fact checkers and too many hoax <laughs> hoaxes. But um, there is another dimension to the issue of fake news, which is that not only there are hoaxes, but even something that might be true can be treated as fake and can be labeled as fake news. So in that field, we are specialists. We are because Berlusconi was the great, um, the great inventor of that, of denying anything, of denying the truth of anything that was not convenient. And so this so is so how basically Trump is emulating. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we have the original. I mean. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, we did it before. You name it, we did it. Uh, fascism, you know, uh, media corruption, politics via media fame. We did it. We know it. We were the first. Uh, corruption. Oh, women uh, harassment. Uh, you know, all of that. Specialists. So. Yeah, so, but this is very important because Berlusconi, what did he do? This is why it was important that he had control of so-called news channels because he could, he could invent alternative truths, right? Yeah, well, that would, well, that would get us into philosophy, which you don't want to do. <laughs> That is long gone. That was in the days when there was one channel, or maybe two channels, but there was only one, the monopoly of Rai, and that. No, now it's, now I think it's widely comparable. Uh, you also have uh, advertisements which interrupt programming. Um, you have, um, you also have brand promotion through, um, um, uh, other programming, like, you know, you do a quiz show and something is given by, I don't know, uh, Barilla Pasta, you know, I'm just saying. So there are sponsors. No, I would say that right now it's widely comparable. I, I can't think of any significant meaningful I difference, I maybe Anna. Yes, about that, very interesting because uh, it's something new to me. Uh, we can't have uh, um, advertisement about drugs. Uh, that's <laughs> amazing. For me, it's amazing because we can't have that. 
So um, we don't watch television and we don't see, well, when we watch television, we don't see advertisement about drugs. I think it's not possible. I have never think about that. But it's not possible, I think. I think it's not allowed. It's illegal, maybe it's illegal. So um, and that's uh, strange to me, you know? So people know the name of the drug they need and maybe they go to the doctor asking the name Absolutely. of the drug and we don't do that uh, and we don't know so well the name of the drugs uh, and uh, we make confidence to the doctor yeah 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 that, that is major and yeah that is major major absolutely it's also strange because if you listen one thing that makes me laugh every time I listen to one of these drug commercials is that they have to tell you the side effects, which always include death. You know what I mean? So maybe I'm going to keep my headache or my constipation, you know, because it's better to be constipated than dying, you know. It's such a strange thing. Do we have, do we have any more questions? <coughs> Otherwise, thank you so much, Anna, Jason, Marina.